Hi guys and welcome to another edition of Seekers of the Supernatural with your host, yours truly, Tony Spera. I want to show you an old uh, presentation that Ed Warren gave on devils, ghosts, demons, etc. What he did, he wanted to preserve it somehow, so he gave like himself a, a lecture using a camcorder and this is rudimentary remember this is back well probably the mid 80s to early 90s he took a camcorder and he had a projector screen and he had a slide projector and what he did was he projected these images onto this onto the slide projector uh, screen and taped it with his video camera and spoke over it narrated it and what you're going to see is some of the real uh, slides that he would show at his lectures at colleges and such, he and Lorraine. You'll see uh, pictures of ghosts. You'll see places they've been and investigated. Uh, one house in West Hartford called the Donovan House. That's actually in the book, The Demonologist. He shows some photos from that. He shows the Cross Keys Hotel cursed chair up in... Uh, Thirst, England. I was there too. You'll see my bushy hair face <laughs> there. And uh, the chair is now hanging on a wall in a museum. It's, we'll tell you, he'll tell you all about it in that lecture. And then he'll talk about probably miraculous miracles a little bit too. At the end of it though, he talks about the Enfield, England case. Now what that is, that's the poltergeist case in Enfield, England back in 1977 that the movie The Conjuring 3, The Devil, I'm sorry, Conjuring 2 uh, was based on The Conjuring 2, the movie that's already been out based on the poltergeist in Enfield, England and you'll hear spirit voices never heard probably before on YouTube the actual spirit voices it's only a small clip of it but it's still pretty compelling uh, clip of these spirits that would the voices would just issue out of thin air you would just hear these voices emanating from around you and you couldn't tell exactly where they're coming from now some of the investigators like Maurice Gross that was there from uh, the, uh, the England Society for Cyclical Research uh, said and Guy Playfair were saying that the girls were doing it but they tested the girls at first they thought they were doing it then they tested the girls and said they're not ventriloquists they can't be making those kind of noises they're very deep guttural grumbling voices that you'll hear right at the end of this presentation that you're going to see so without any further ado i'm going to put on the uh, put on ed's presentation to do is to go into the different types of phenomena that we encounter in what is called the haunted house with the ghost the apparition for instance, when we go into such buildings as Glam's Castle here, which of course is the most haunted castle in all of Scotland, it's not just Lorraine and I that go in. We take with us a group of very knowledgeable individuals. And amongst these people would be the clairvoyants, the mediums, the sensitives, such as Lorraine here, who is very important to the investigator's work. Since, of course, I am not clairvoyant, I cannot see clairvisually, cannot hear clairvoyantly, I cannot see through what they call the mind's eye as the medium would. I cannot communicate with the ghosts. It is very important to have the clairvoyance with us. Lorraine here is a light trance medium, which means that she can see clairvoyantly and can hear clairvisually. It would not pay for an investigator such as myself to see ghosts splitting all over the place when nobody else could see them. Then, of course, there are the photographers. One would be a professional. He or she would be using high-speed film, infrared film, since this will still pick up the materialization of the ghost even after it has disappeared through heat energy left behind by the apparition or ghost. On the other hand, the other person, 
who is taking photographs could be like anybody in this room tonight no real knowledge of photography but they are always very sensitive and compassionate people through what we call the laws of attraction the ghost or apparition is drawn to that person who is called a psychic photographer. Now they will be using ordinary film, black and white, colored. They'll even be using a Polaroid sometime. The ghost or apparition is drawn to that person by their aura, not by their physical looks. And that's through a phenomena called psychokinesis or psychokinesis, which simply means to mind over matter. They will project your image onto the film. For instance, if I were Andrew Jackson here, I wish to project my image onto the film, I would simply think of what I look like, stride my horse here in my uniform, and on top of the horse itself. Then produce, hopefully, a thought picture. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, if that's really true, you could take a picture of a ghost. How come we don't see any of these photographs in newspapers, magazines, and so forth? Well, if you're looking for them, as psychic researchers do, you would. Some of them, of course, are mere hoaxes. Others are very genuine. Let's take this photograph here of the elderly lady in the back seat of this car. Now, she had her photograph taken. That wasn't too unusual. The unusual part comes in because of the fact it was taken two weeks after she was buried. And this is how it came about. Her son-in-law and her daughter had gone to the grave site in Ipswich to take a picture of the mother's grave. Well, some people do this. But there was still one shot left in the camera. So the wife told the husband to jump into the front seat of the car and she'd use up the film. But when they had the film processed, there was Mum sitting in the back seat, just like she had for all those Sunday drives through that beautiful English countryside. Well, how could this be? The lady's dead, she's buried, what is she doing in the back of the car there? Well, try to visualize the scene to yourself. Her daughter, her son-in-law. They're taking a photograph of her grave. Naturally, they're talking about her. Now, she doesn't have to get into a car to go somewhere. She doesn't have to jump on a train or a plane. She is there instantly through thought. To give you an example, think of the young man who is thousands of miles away from home, soldier, who is dying of wounds received in battle. His last thoughts are perhaps of his mother, his father. Later on, they learned that it was only seconds after he died on that battlefield so far away from home that he appeared to one of these people the mother or the father. We call that a visitation apparition, a gift from God. Well, as I said, this lady here was there instantly through thought, through what they call recognition, actually. The same thing that spiritualists do during a seance. And then by thinking of how she looked, sitting in the car there, projected this thought picture onto the film. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that everything you will see and hear tonight have been checked out by such credible organizations as the British Society for Psychic Research, the American Society for Psychical Research, and of course, our own New England Society for Psychic Research, of which I am the director. Well, this young man's name is Neil Deck. He lives in Yorkshire, England, one of our favorite places. It was Neil's 16th birthday. His uncle had taken three pictures of him in front of that building, right in front of that window. The sixth, seventh, and eighth pictures. Now, this is the seventh. If you look toward the window, you will see that it has no shade and no curtains. But the sixth and the eighth pictures show curtains and a shade. But also, there's something just to the right of Neil there, which shouldn't be there. How many of you see an elderly lady looking very intently at the puppy? Well, let's point her out for those that can't see her. Probably looking right beyond her. Here's the left eye. 
the right eye, the nose, the mouth, the chin. Here's the whole face. And she has gray hair which starts at her forehead and comes right down onto her shoulder there. But notice that she's looking very intently at the puppy, not the boy. It was the laws of attraction that drew the spirit of this woman to the dog, since she had many pets in her lifetime. And she lived in that apartment that you see in the background there with the window. And when she lived there, she had no curtains and no shade in the window because she had numerous plants in that window. But some of you had seen another face, this face of this lady and her hair. Well, we don't know who she was. So, if we don't know who the entity is, it's considered a ghost. But we do know who the lady was that's looking so intensely at the puppy. So she's considered an apparition. Here is one of the most fantastic psychic photographs I have seen in over 42 years. It was taken in Milford, Connecticut, just a few years ago. It was taken by a young man who had just finished putting up this wall. He was very proud of it. In fact, he was so proud of it that he took a photograph of it. But when the film came back and he opened up the package, he was very disappointed. He said to his wife, look at this. They've ruined my picture. There's a bunch of guys' faces in here. Well, what he didn't realize is that he had taken a psychic photograph of numerous Northern Civil War officers. They look sort of though they come down in a spinal column. At first we thought it was one man in different phases of his life. But then when we checked into it, we found that it was not. You can see the lapellettes of the shoulders on the, sho the left shoulder there. Let's go up a little closer. Now, as I said, this is one of the most remarkable spirit pictures I have ever come across. Notice the clear features of these officers. We are still investigating this particular photograph, so perhaps the next time we come here, we'll be able to tell you a little bit more about it. How would you like to see this gentleman standing by your bookcase when you get home tonight? Well, there are people, you know, who would like to see a ghost. They would perhaps like to see a ghost appear right now alongside of me. That wouldn't be too bad. Not when you're with your friends here and in this auditorium. But I think all the confusion comes in in regards to ghosts and apparitions, the way people experience them. For instance, let's take a hypothetical situation. Let us say that you do go home tonight you have a friend with you, you open up the door, snap on the lights, and you see this gentleman standing by the bookcase. But your friend does not. Well, why is that? Because a telepathic image of the ghost has been projected to you bypassing the physical eye and going into the mind's eye or the third eye. You see it, your friend does not. And it's meant to be that way. Because what we call diabolical confusion is already setting in, or infestation. Although it may look like a man, it might be something which has never walked the earth in human form. Well, there are also times when ghosts or apparitions can appear even in crowds. For example, a few years back at Westchester State College in Pennsylvania, Lorraine and I have been giving a program similar to this. There were about 800 people in the audience that night. Suddenly, halfway through the presentation, I could hear all of this shuffling of feet, mumbling, and I thought, what the heck is going on here? Then Lorraine came over. She pointed to something over to the left of the stage. I took a look at it, and it was a very dignified-looking gentleman, solid as we are, dark suit, shirt, tie, eyeglasses, and then he was gone. Now, most of the people in the audience that night thought that we had somehow manifested this ghost for their pleasure. Well, we did not. And the director of student activities, who knew that we did not, was so frightened by it 
that he insisted on staying in our room in the hotel that night alongside the bed. So you see, not everybody wants to see a ghost. And that particular ghost, of course, was an ex-president of the college who had died many years before. But I think the time that you're going to see a ghost or an apparition will probably be around 3 o'clock in the morning. Anybody know why I picked 3 o'clock? That's the devil's hour. Anything that comes in threes is an insult to the Trinity. Well, let's say that uh, you're sound asleep. Something awakens you. Now, it could be a touch, a sound, maybe even the blankets being pulled off. Oh, yes. Blankets have been pulled off people, and that will awaken you. Or how about the case of Mr. and Mrs. Merle in West Piston, Pennsylvania? The book, The Haunted, was written on their experiences. Mrs. Merle would have something grab her by the leg and yank her right out of the bed and onto the floor. Now, if that doesn't wake you up, nothing will. But you're probably saying to yourself right now, that's ridiculous. Nothing could grab you by the leg and pull you out of a bed. Well, let me ask you a question. Hasn't there been some hot night when, you know, you just took your leg and you pushed it outside of the sheets, and then you let it dangle off the bed a little bit. But then all of a sudden, it dawned on you that there could be something under that bed. And didn't you drag that foot very quickly back under those sheets? Well, nobody believes in ghosts, but everybody seems to be afraid of them. Did anybody notice something suspicious about our ghost? A shadow. A shadow in the back of our ghostly friend here. Well, ghosts don't throw shadows, do they? Or do they? Look at Katie King here. Katie King had 44 pictures taken of her by a very famous scientist, a physicist, Sir Arthur Crookes, in 1874 during a seance with spiritualists. Katie King would manifest through a physical medium. This would come through ectoplasmic material, which would emanate from this young woman, Florence Cook, 18 years old at the time. She would walk around the seance room. She would talk with the people, sometimes go arm in arm with them, kiss them lightly on the cheek, and then she would dematerialize. But look at the shadows. Look at the shadows on Katie King here, on her arms, her folds of her dress, her face, as solid as we are. So ghosts and apparitions can form shadows. In fact, they have been seen in broad daylight, which was an experience I went through not too long ago. And it was the first one of its type at high noon in, a, in an ancient cemetery in eastern Connecticut. But you notice that I've been saying that um, Katie King here, it, this is her name, I didn't say it was her name. Because this lady, who had 44 photographs of her taken back in 1874, which have never to this day been proven to be fraudulent, had materialized before a group of spiritualists in London, England, only two years ago. You see, time and distance make no difference in the spirit world. Well, look at this beautiful lady standing here with Lorraine. Unfortunately, Lorraine seems to have lost one of her eyes. Only a defect, of course, in the film. But our interest right now lies in the young lady standing with my wife. She had come to me and told me a beautiful experience that she had. Now, you notice that I said beautiful. And indeed it was. She lived in Milford, Connecticut, on the shore, right on the ocean. When she had been pregnant, the doctors had recommended that she walk along the beach uh, during the morning or afternoon for exercise. After about four or five days of this, she was joined by an elderly man, perhaps in his middle 70s. She had never met this man before. But there was an instant rapport. She didn't understand this. 
because it felt as though she had met a family member that she hadn't seen for a long time. Well, he had told her that he was retired, he had been a fisherman all of his life, and he would point out the interesting facets of the sea, the different types of shells, seaweed, the driftwood. In fact, he gave her a piece of driftwood, which he still has today. Well, then she went to the hospital. She had her child. She came home. She resumed her walks. First day, second day, third day, the old man wasn't around. She was curious. She really liked this old gentleman. And she had remembered that he had said he lived just up the beach where there stood a group of cottages. So she went up there and she inquired of the residents. And when she described this man to these people, they were flabbergasted. Because they said that the man she was describing had died over 10 years before. A spirit guide. Each and every one of you in this room has at least one or more spirit guides. You might have met that spirit guide just like this young lady did and not even known it. These are spirits that could be family members that had died many years before you were even born or even why you had after you had been born. Or it could be a spirit that is just attracted to you through the laws of attraction. They will help you out in many different types of things in life. Well, the two young girls that you see here were victims of satanic rituals and a satanic grandfather. He would take these two girls' mothers and her mother and her two sisters, when they were these girls' ages, into the cellar of his home. He would light conjuring candles. He would call on demons and devils for favors and for these favors received that promised his soul and that cursed his family. Now you're saying, oh my God, this guy's going into the medieval ages talking about curses. Curses, ladies and gentlemen, can be very, very real, unfortunately. The diabolical spirits are just waiting for the invitation from a human being to curse another human being through their own free will. Remember that it was Jesus Christ who had first taken curses off people on this planet. He was not mistaken. They were cursed. He was not mistaken when he had driven devils and demons from the possessed. They did not have the Tourette syndrome. They were not schizophrenics. They were not mentally ill. They were diabolically possessed. Well, if you will look at the grandchildren of this man who was a high priest in a satanic cult in New England, look at the girl on the left. You will see a huge diabolical face staring out at you from the top of her hair to the bottom of the hair. You only see half the face. Kind of squint your eyes. You'll see it better. Here you see the left eye, large and dark. The right eye. The eyebrow. The long nose going down to the lips. And then to the chin where there's a short cropped beard. And then going up the left side of the face toward the eye and up toward the forehead where the hair looks as though it has been brushed down onto the forehead. Once you see this face in this photograph, you will see nothing else. I doubt if there's anybody in this room who would have ever stayed in their house a full night when the manifestations were taking place in that farmhouse in Willimantic, Connecticut. Many people say, well, why couldn't the image of the face in the girl's hair be created by the flash of the camera? It's an exact likeness of their grandfather, which I had seen materialized many times in that farmhouse. We used to show a picture to compare it with of this man, but unfortunately the family has requested that we not do so. Here you see a physical medium. This is the highest type of mediumship where physical phenomena comes about. You can't see the ectoplasm which forms the materialization. 
emanating from the nostrils, the mouth, the ears, the top of the head, sometimes from the solar plexus. It will sometimes only form part of a human anatomy, such as this elderly man's face here. Or it might form a full materialization, as was created by Ethel Parrish Post, the physical medium here, in an effort of Pennsylvania at Camp Silver Bell, a spiritualist camp. You see the first shot showing the materialization of Silver Bell. Now you see the second. Incidentally, she is an Indian maiden. And now the third, the full materialization. My only problem with this would be as a religious demonologist, is it really an Indian maiden or is it something else that has never walked the earth in human form except through possession of a physical body of a human being? One of the most interesting photographs of the psychic nature that I had come across many years ago was taken by a Mrs. Ethel Whitaker in Monroe, Connecticut. In fact, that is our hometown. It was 20 years ago when Mrs. Whitaker came to me after a similar program that we're doing right now at a woman's club, showed me a photograph, said that she had taken a picture of her husband out raking the driveway one day, and when they had the film process, they could not understand why a little girl and boy transparencies appeared in that photograph, since her camera could not double expose and they had no children. Look at this picture as though you're looking into a reflection of a plate glass window. Here you see the head and face of a little girl. She has on a black jacket, a white blouse with black trim, and a short black skirt that goes down to her knees. Next to her is her brother. Here you see the face and head, the right shoulder, the arm, going down to the handlebars of a bike, and then the fork of a bike. What we found out through investigation was that these two children had died over 30 years before Mrs. Whitaker had ever taken this picture in a drowning accident. The little girl had remained what we call earthbound. The boy had passed over correctly. When the spirit of this little child was activated through the sensitivity of Mrs. Whitaker's aura, she became very alert, and then thinking of a happy moment in her lifetime and her brother's, projected this thought picture onto the film, clothing, bicycle, the whole thing. I am happy to say that we did help this little child's spirit to pass over correctly. Well, Torrington High School, Torrington, Connecticut. During the Vietnam War, 15-year-old girl going from one class to another finds one of her classmates, a young man with long hair, sound asleep. Had a camera with her, and as a joke, had taken his photograph. But the joke was on her, as you'll see. Here you see the face of another young man with eyeglasses on. The left eye, the right eye, the nose, the mouth, the chin. Here's the whole face. But just a little further up to the left, you see another young man's face who seems to be wearing a World War I helmet. Not quite as clear as the young man with the eyeglasses on, who died many months before this photograph was ever taken in Vietnam. Well, how would you girls like to own this Raggedy Ann doll? I don't think so. This doll was given to a young woman, a nurse in Hartford, Connecticut, who was 28 years old at the time, as a Christmas present by her mother. Well, you know how girls are. She would take the doll to bed with her at night, you know, cuddle up to it and go to sleep like you would with a pillow sometimes. She lived with another nurse from Hartford Hospital about four blocks away from the hospital itself. Well, this young lady would take the doll in the morning sometimes and she'd bring it over to the breakfast nook. And fooling around, the two girls would talk to the doll as though it were a child. One morning, the arms of the doll levitated onto the table. Now, this didn't frighten them. This intrigued them. And one said to the other, 
there must be a spirit in that doll. And they told some of the other nurses at the hospital that afternoon what happened. They all agreed that a seance should be held. Well, they got a medium. That seance was held, and in the course of it, the medium had told them that there was a spirit of a six-year-old girl in the doll by the name of Annabelle. That Annabelle had been killed in an automobile accident just outside of their apartment house. Well, this created great sympathy. This was no longer a doll. This was a child. They bought a clothing, jewelry. You see a little bracelet on the arm over here, gold bracelet. But they held more seances. They held more communication. They opened up many more doors. This was not the spirit of Annabelle, a six-year-old girl. It was, of course, a diabolical spirit which came in the guise of that little child's spirit to create sympathy, to bring them right down that primrose path to destruction. Well, you know, the girls had lived in that apartment for a couple of years together. They were never afraid to be alone. All of a sudden, during the seances and after them, they would be afraid to be left alone in the apartment. They would leave the doll on the bed in the bedroom. They would go off, say, to the 4 to 12 shift, come home after midnight. They'd open up the door, and there'd be Annabelle, standing, waiting for them. Now, this doll cannot stand up. There's no way that you can stand it up. It's very flimsy. But this has also occurred in our own home, where we have brought the doll later, as you'll see. The fiancé of one of the girls was against all of this nonsense of seances and communication and so forth. And one afternoon on a Saturday, while the girls were puttering about cleaning up the, the apartment, he fell asleep on the couch. He woke up with a start. And he said, oh my God, what a nightmare I just had. I jumped to Annabelle there, was strangling me. The doll had been placed in a chair in the living room where he was near where he was at. He walked over, picked up the doll, he looked at it, and he said, you're nothing but a rag doll, you couldn't hurt anyone. That was his first mistake. It was not a rag doll that he was dealing with. He was dealing with the devils of hell. He took it through it right across the room, before it even hit the floor. Seven slashes, psychic slashes, occurred on his body, four on the chest on his stomach. Blood came through his t-shirt. The girls witnessed this. Then infestation took place. Objects started moving in the room. Chairs, lamps. He was almost hit by a vase. Now they were all frightened. They called the High Episcopal Canon in Hartford, Connecticut. He called Father Richard Nolan. Father Nolan called us. We went to the house and exorcism was performed immediately in the home. And, of course, the people had to go under counseling for many weeks later because of this incident. The doll was taken back to my study, where it is still today. Only now we call it a museum, an occult museum. What we wanted to do was to watch and see if any phenomena would occur around it that we could record. The doll would be found in different areas of our own home, teleportation taking place. There was the time when a Catholic priest had come to my home. He wanted to show me and Lorraine his brand new car. Well, then he said to me, Ed, I understand you have a doll that puts slashes on people, and he kind of gave a chuckle. I took him down into the study. He seen the doll on a chair. He walked over to it, picked it right up, and threw it across the room and said, God is more powerful than the devil. I said, yes, Father, you're right. God is more powerful than the devil, but no priest is, no hundred priests. He had challenged the diabolical. That challenge would be met soon after he left our house. On his way home, back to the rectory, his brand new car went out of control, almost head-on into a tractor-trailer truck. Miraculously, he was not killed. But the last thing he remembered seeing was the image of this doll. A homicide detective, six foot two, 230 pounds, used to seeing grisly sights. 
Lorraine and I were working on the murder of a little girl in Connecticut here with him. After our interview, he said to me, Ed, I understand that you have an occult museum out there in back of your home. Now remember that these objects are not there just as souvenirs. They are there to show people what types of phenomena can occur from such things as even a Raggedy Ann doll. There are numerous witchcraft items. There are things taken from black magic and sorcery, haunted houses. We have circular embolism performed around all of these items to confine the very negative vibrations to just a certain area. But it is still very dangerous to keep them there. But I feel that in showing very serious people who are dedicated about this work, the actual objects that were used, it's much easier for them to identify this type of phenomena later on when they become investigators. Well, I brought him down into the occult museum. He looked around and he said, you know, Ed, of all the things you have here, I can't take my eyes off that doll. Now, the doll was still not encased as it is today. The phone rang. It was a personal call. I asked him not to touch anything in the room, since these were the unholy, the unblessed. The opposite of what you would find, say, in a church, a chapel, a temple. I had gone up to take the personal call in the main part of the house. I left him down in the museum looking around. Warned him, again, do not touch anything. It was only about ten minutes later when I heard him coming up the stairs. He was stumbling, white, incoherent. He couldn't speak. I thought he was having a heart attack. I sat him down and was about to call an ambulance when he stopped me. He said, no, Ed, it isn't that. I asked him what was wrong. He said he couldn't tell me. I guess he was embarrassed. Just then Lorraine came in. He said, I'll tell Lorraine, but I don't want her ever to talk about it again. She never has. But she didn't have to. I went back down into the museum. Everything was knocked over as though there had been a terrible struggle. The doll was in a corner of a room where it had not been before on the floor. I knew what he did. He picked up the doll. And something so terrible occurred that this man, who had been on the police department for over 20 years, resigned and now lives in California. The Ouija board. I realize that many of you people here have used the Ouija board and nothing has ever happened, thank God. But I always say that it's kind of like going across a busy highway. Many people get across. Some don't. This girl didn't. 13 years old. Some years ago, she and her 10-year-old cousin had been using the Ouija board as a game. I remember that this game, the whole idea is to communicate with spirits of the dead. When you do that, through your own free will, you are accepting any type of spirit to come to you. There are no protective measures when you use the Ouija board. Well, the spirit that they were communicating with said that it was that of an 18-year-old boy. It said that it had been killed by the police in a rape attempt. And then many obscenities, filthy remarks, would come across the board. This didn't bother these young girls. The 13-year-old said one night, if you're really a spirit, prove it. Show yourself. Move something. Put a light. The message came across. It wouldn't come to her then, but it would come to her later. And, indeed, it did. 20 minutes after this young girl retired to bed, her mother heard screams coming from the bedroom. She ran in. The girl was thrashing about, yelling her head off that something had gotten into bed with her, that she could feel hands on her body. The mother, of course, attributed this to a nightmare, knowing that the girls had been talking about ghosts and fooling with the Ouija board. She told the girl to calm down, go back to sleep, that she'd leave the lights on in the bedroom. But the girl, mother had not even returned to her own bedroom, when a girl, again, the girl was screaming. This time when she walked into the bedroom, she said it was icy cold, psychic cold. You see, the heat from the room would be drawn from the person. The heat in the room will be drawn from the room itself to manifest 
different types of phenomena. Persons seeing ghosts might at first see in bed, lying there, small pin pinpoints of light moving away from their body, about the brilliance of a firefly. These will form into small balls, about the size of a half dollar. They will move about the room very quickly, form into one large size ball, about the size of a basketball. Then it will go into a cigar shape and then you will see what we call the ghost or apparition. Many times people will have another experience also, and I'm sure that some of you have had it right here in this room. Have you ever woke up at night, knew that you were awake, but you couldn't move, you couldn't budge. You, your eyes are open, but you couldn't yell out. Sometimes you feel a heavy pressure on your body. Well, after a while you are able to move. And of course, when you put on the light, the ghost that has appeared to you will probably disappear since it is comprised of an electrical field. Kind of like trying to see a white dot against a white sheet. Now, if you were to put that light off again, which you're not going to do, you might see it again. But getting back to this young lady here, the mother was terribly frightened. She said there was a foul stench, like rotting flesh. She sat on the bed, started to read from a Bible. There was a sensation like an animal, a cat or a dog, running around the room, jumping onto the bed from time to time. Now they were both frightened. The mother called the father home from work. But before he got there, the Bible was torn out of the mother's hands, thrown up against the wall, and when it hit the floor, it looked like a bunch of confetti. The girl had been thrown out of the bed. Well, the father called a doctor in, their doctor. He didn't know what to do. He called a priest. The priest didn't know what to do. Not all priests are knowledgeable in the area of demonology. I will never forget this girl when she was brought to me three nights later. She looked as though she had been in a terrible accident. Cuts, bruises, burns. These are psychic wounds. As she stood less than six feet away from me, in my study, the room became icy cold. There was that stench of rotting flesh. I knew what was happening. The girl looked into one corner of the room. Her eyes bugged out and she started to scream that it was coming for her again. Before her parents could reach her, the girl went up onto her toes. She left the floor a few inches. Her hair went up into the air and was torn right out of her scalp. Teeth marks appeared on her arms and legs with saliva on them. You think that this is rare. Even as I talk to you here, recording this particular case in Litchfield, Connecticut. A woman, 46 years old, is having the very same phenomena occur to her. The hair is being torn out of her head. She is being levitated and thrown across rooms. She is being burnt. There are psychic slashes and claw marks that appear on her body. You see, ladies and gentlemen, once you open up that door to that preternatural world of devils and demons. There is nothing that will keep them out. There is no wall high enough, no wall thick enough, no lock strong enough. They will come, and they will come at their leisure, not when you want them to come. Well, I have to say that this young girl was freed through the ritual Romano which is the ultimate right of exorcism where Catholicism is concerned. I know she'll never pick up a Ouija board again. Anybody know where the Ouija board is manufactured? Salem, Massachusetts. And you know they don't even put out an iota of advertisement and they sell thousands of these boards every year. years in the lonely mansion house owned by Lord Townsend. There have been many who have seen her. In 1937, 
a professional photographer was commissioned by Lord Townsend, the owner, to take pictures of his great manor house inside and out. I guess for insurance reasons. His name was Captain Provan. As he was going about his work, he had just set up his camera, when, to his great surprise, he found he was not alone. For there coming down the grand staircase was the specter of Dorothy Walpole, as she was called in life. He was not about to lose this opportunity of getting a picture of a truly bona fide apparition. Lucky for him and us, the flash of the bulb was not as bright as they are today. I decided to investigate this ghostly lady the first time we went to England. I did not think I should forewarn Lord Townsend of our plans to visit him, as I felt I would have a better chance of entering the hallowed halls of Raynham by talking to him in person. As we drove down the long driveway, I started to have some misgivings about my decision as there were just too many no trespassing signs. But as soon as we stopped in front of the great house, I had a brilliant idea. I would send Lorraine up to the door. I always send Lorraine up first, so she will feel useful, you understand, plus the fact that she was less likely to get thrown off the property than I was. But when the pro housekeeper answered the door, the news was not good. Lord Townsend was in the south of France on holiday or vacation to you Americans, and would not be back for two weeks. As I stood by our car, I realized I was looking at the church and the graveyard that Dorothy Walpole had been buried in. So we decided to go down and have a look at the gravesite. Lorraine, as a clairvoyant, felt she should walk down the road to the church, the very road the brown lady had walked numerous times during her tragic lifetime. She, is said, was starved physically to death by her husband, the Vice Council, uh, Town Townsend. Tragedies create the ghost syndrome. Thus, we have this haunting occurring over hundreds of years. She immediately picked up the presence of the brown lady. As I walked around the ancient graveyard, I suddenly had an urge to look at the map of England. My eyes were drawn to a small fishing village on the east coast called Cromer. It was about 60 miles from where we were. I had heard of it when I was in the Navy in World War II, mostly about how English fishermen saved the lives of both English and American pilots whose planes were shot down and wound up in the cold North Sea. Well, we arrived about 7 o'clock at night. The village was as quaint as I thought it would be. High cliffs, quaint, uh, quaint homes. So we decided that we would then have a nice English fish dinner. But while in the res restaurant, we had met an English couple, and of course they were curious about why the Americans were in that part of England at that time of year, which was early for tourists. We explained to them about what had occurred at Raynham Hall, and of course my disappointment. The gentleman looked at me very surprised, and he said, hold on one second, I'll be right back. Well, he went into the part of the restaurant, which is the pub, and in about 10 minutes he came out, and with him was a young man and a young woman, both very nice people, who he introduced as Sir Christopher White and Lady White, Baron and Baroness of Raynham Hall. Well, of course, it was hard for me to accept this. Here we were in a strange village none of us had ever been to before. We were trying to get into Raynham Hall. On just some kind of a hunch, I decided to pick out this little village on the east coast of England. We go into a restaurant, and who's there? The Baron of Raynham Hall. Well, the man was very helpful. He was very courteous. In fact, he had invited us back to his own manor house which was in Cromer, and he gave us numerous items to take back with us on the television show, which we would be having when we arrived back in New York, including numerous photographs of his mother and father when they were being married on the steps of Raynham there, and of course the uh, credentials which I needed to prove that one brown lady of Raynham Hall actually was seen by family members 
his own experiences as a boy at the Great Hall. So our trip turned out to be a great success. Well, what you're looking at here is called the most haunted castle in all of Scotland, Glam's Castle. And well, it should be for the many ghosts that roam its lonely halls. Lady Glam's, it is said, was burnt to death about 400 years ago for witchcraft. I don't believe that this beautiful woman actually was performing witchcraft arts. But in those days, you were accused of witchcraft for any reason. And you were burnt at the stake in Edinburgh. But her ghostly apparition has appeared many times at Glam's, especially in the chapel of the uh, castle itself. But in the crypt are heard many times the arguments between the two lords who had fought to the death and in the lonely passageways a young boy is often seen wandering its lonely halls not only there but also in the huge dining room how would you like to be confined in a contraption like this well many people were in the medieval days in those castles that hold too many dark secrets. Imagine being confined. It's not like in the movies where someone comes and saves you in the end. No. Your only thought is escape. But you can't escape. Not from something like this. But yet, many did. How? With the astral body. In their great desire, they actually left that physical body with the astral body. But the unfortunate thing is that once the silver cord, as they call it, breaks that connects from the astral to the physical body, then of course death takes place to that physical body. And that person might remain in what we refer to as an earthbound uh, spirit. Even though the earthbound spirit will go to a loved one, Try to communicate with that loved one. Many times they cannot. So they wander in their great despair, sometimes for many, many years. They are confused. They are not what we call with it, simply because of the torturing that took place in the beginning. If they died in a mental state, this is the way they will remain for some time. In 1896, Lord Compromere had been in a terrible accident in which he died and on the day of his burial a psychic was in his library and had seen the ghostly form of Lord Cavanmere. Of course this was quite visually. Not everyone could see such an apparition the same way. Well cameras were set up and pictures were taken and here you see the end result. In the chair, well, let's go up a little closer here. In this chair, you can see the head, the shoulder, and the arm very clearly of Lord Compromere in his favorite chair. And this actually took place at the moment of his burial in a churchyard nearby. The beautiful lady that you see peering out the window is not quite physical. In fact, she is one of the 44 suicides that had taken place in this manor house in London. It seems that numerous people would be obsessed with the idea of committing suicide after entering this home until 1960 when it had to be destroyed. What, what you're looking at here is called Whitby Abbey. It's on the North Sea and uh, there are numerous legends connected with these ruins. We've spent many nights with camera and recorder trying to record the ghostly phenomena that we would hear and see. It is said that there are numerous psychic phenomena in regards to vampires. Yes, I said vampires. 
In fact, it was Bram Stoker who wrote the first book on Dracula, who had his Dracula land right here on the North Sea in these ruins and used it in the first book that he had ever written on vampires. Well, many nights, our small party of adventurers, ghost hunters, would enter these ruins. I would station them all around in different places in twos and threes. Usually we have about 18 to 20 people. They have always come back with recordings of ghostly voices or even photographs of ghosts. But imagine if you can, for a moment, when the fog drifts in off the North Sea, what kind of a feeling you would have sitting there in the dark around 1.30 in the morning, 2 o'clock, waiting for some ghostly apparition to appear. We've done this many times. Many times we have not been disappointed. But of course the uh, full moon is the legendary time of werewolves. Well, you don't believe in werewolves either. All I can say is, come with us some year to England. Let me place you in one of the lonely locations near the ruins with your friend, a partner. Have your thermos of coffee. And when it gets to be around midnight, one o'clock, then tell me you don't believe in vampires and werewolves. The chair you see hanging on the wall here is called the chair of death. A gentleman by the name of Busby in 1702 had murdered his father-in-law and for this heinous crime had been put to death by hanging. But what they did was a vigilante type hanging. A group of men had gone to the tavern that you see here, which he owned, had placed him on his favorite chair, this chair, thrown a rope up over one of the beams, and just before the man was put to death, one of the executioners laughingly looked up at him and said, I'll put that chair to better use after you're gone. He looked down at the men and said, anyone using this chair, his favorite one, would die. Well, the man had taken up a challenge. He had taken the chair. He used it for a couple of days. But the day after, he was kicked to death by his favorite horse. In 1969, an unfortunate wife of one of the owners was cleaning up the attic, found the chair, sat in and cleaned it up. That very afternoon, going down to the village in her car, she was killed in a terrible crash. Then six other people took up the challenge. Four soldiers from a nearby base, two civilians. They also died within four days after sitting in that chair. I don't think that I would sit in that chair. I don't know about you. Anyhow, we did go to Thirsk. I had to find out about it. Was this story true? We arrived in Thirsk and found out that the chair had been put in a museum. But before we arrived, about 10 miles from the museum, we had two blowouts. Not one blowout, two blowouts at the same time. Is that natural? The number of our car, 13. Maybe that was a bad omen in itself. Luckily for us, the young ladies who were following us in their car had a spare that would fit ours, so we were able to get to a garage. The same two ladies were almost killed by a tanker truck on the way to the museum. They had just been about to pull out when this huge tanker truck came around a curve. They had plenty of time to see it, but they claimed they did not. Luckily for them, the driver was a professional and was able to turn in time to save their lives. We arrived at the Army base and spoke with some of the soldiers who had told us about the sergeant and the other three soldiers who had been killed of unnatural causes. I should say, died of unnatural causes. 
Since the four of them were found usually in bed, an autopsy had taken place. There was no cause as to why they should have died. But they died. Lorraine, in the meantime, after leaving the museum with ourselves, driving toward Loch Ness, decided to visit with Father Gregory Brucey, one of our dear friends who was the prior of Loch Ness on St. Benedict's, uh, St. Benedict's Monastery. Again, tragedy struck. She hemorrhaged so badly we had to race her to a hospital 28 miles away. Fortunately for us, we arrived in time. Was this all due to the, as they call it, the cursed chair? Well, I have a strong feeling that it could have been. Actor John Williams, who you've probably seen in many movies here in the United States, lives about uh, 70 miles from Thirsk. He had said to us that he knew about the chair, that he would never sit in that chair. Well, as I said earlier, I don't think I'd ever sit in that chair. Would you? I had heard about a um, haunted inn, the Cross Keys Inn in People's Scotland, where hauntings of a terrible nature had taken place. People had been hurt. People had been frightened out of the Cross Keys Hotel. I spoke with one of the ministers in the village. He had told me that he had seen the ghostly form of what he described as an elderly woman with a shawl around, around her shoulders and a bonnet on her hat and a very mean look on her face. The owner of the Cross Keys Hotel also told me that he had seen the ghostly apparition many times. It is said that to be that of uh, one Marion Ritchie, who was the last owner before English owners started to take over. She was of Scottish descent. And they feel that because it was an Englishman who had taken over the Cross Keys Hotel that the hauntings started. The Scots and the uh, English do not exactly get along together. The cook there had said that he had been near the staircase one night when he felt something just in back of him. He turned around and there was the ghostly form of Marion Ritchie with a very mean look on her face. Then the next thing he felt was a push and he went down the stairs. The unfortunate man had to be taken to the hospital and had a broken leg. A newsman by the name of Ninian Reed felt that the whole thing was a hoax. So he decided to go to the hotel and prove it out for himself. As he and the owner were walking through one of the lower passageways in the cellar, the ghost made her appearance. Now Ninian Reed is a definite believer. One of the housemaids there had told Lorraine and I that she had been vacuuming in one of the upstairs hallways when suddenly again their ghostly visitor made an appearance to her. With that, something picked up the vacuum cleaner and threw it off the balcony onto the floor below. Now, the maids across keys work in pairs. The bartender had told us that not long before we had arrived that they had just put up new shelving when suddenly the shelves for no reason, glass shelves, just broke and everything went crashing to the floor. At the same time, a light fixture unscrewed itself when sailing across the room, smashing about a foot away from Marion Ritchie's picture. Well, was Marion Ritchie, the ghost of Cross Keys, trying to tell these people something? Borley, the site of the most haunted house in all of England. A book had been written about it in 1939, which called it exactly that, the most haunted house. 
Well, here you see it. They also said it was a monstrosity of a building with wings going this way and that. It was Reverend Paul who had built the home in 1873. He had seven daughters. Some of them you can't see out here. And all of them had ghostly experiences in this particular rectory, as did every minister that had taken over after him. It was, was as I said, made very famous by this man here, Harry Price, who also brought in over 200 investigators into that home, and all of them had witnessed psychic phenomena of one type or another. When the house burnt down, in 1940, it seems that the haunting simply started taking place in the ancient 12th century church. Well, Lorraine and I, with others, have visited every year now for the past 14 years, usually on our anniversary. We have never been disappointed with some type of phenomenon taking place, as you will see. Our first visit was with two young ladies that you see here. One a psychic photographer, and the other a clairvoyant. I will never forget, as we drove up that road to the church at Borley, I had great expectations, and I was not to be disappointed. But as we walked around the graveyard that afternoon taking photographs, I noticed that the caretaker's house, the windows, had been all boarded up, and fake windows painted on that side of the house which faced the cemetery in the churchyard were the hauntings that bad that they had to block up the windows well we would find out first we had to get the permission again i immediately sent the rain up to the caretaker's door and as you can see she was successful we were allowed to enter the church that night from 10 until 6 the next morning we had spent the previous night at the Bull Hotel. It would be about 10 o'clock when we would leave here and head for Borley. Incidentally, the Bull Hotel was also a very haunted building. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had written much of his Hound of the Baskervilles in one of these rooms here, which took place on the Dartmoor Moors in southern England. Well, we did have that fine supper I decided to take the candle that you see in the picture here and a wine bottle with me to the church since I didn't want to use bright lights. As we drove up to the church around 10.30, and this is how it looks at 10.30 at night in England, it doesn't get too dark in the summertime until about 11 or 12 midnight. Our expectations were very high. I put the key into the door I could hear the resounding effect of it off the stone walls of the church. Opened up the door and right in front of me was the Walgrave Crypt, the gentleman who was responsible for the building of the church in the 12th century, who had also been put to death at the Tower of London for his religious beliefs. Lorraine and the clairvoyant immediately picked up many different types of presences in the building. In fact, they said it was loaded. We were not to be disappointed. What you see here is what is referred to as the ghostly nun of Borley. As I was sitting in the back of the church, all the lights out, Lorraine up on the altar, near the altar, the psychic photographer about halfway down, and the other psychic was right to the right of Lorraine, about 15 feet. I noticed a glow coming down from the back of the chapel, from the vestibule in back of me. The figure that you see here was what I was looking at. Now I could see this with the physical eye, which meant that it was being created through heat energy, bioluminescence, and the electricity probably of our own bodies. It passed me and went down toward where Lorraine was. She did have communication with the Borley nun that very first night we arrived. 
picture was taken with infrared film. On another occasion, around 2.30 in the morning, Lorraine again had the feeling that there were numerous presences in the church. If you look just to the left of her, you will see a bioluminescent form standing right in front of her. But then she described a monk with his habit on going through a large book. If you look just to the left, you will see the top of the hood. You see the large book with the pages going back and forth here. And the knee right here of the monk and his habit. Well, we've returned to Borley many, many times. We will again this year. And I'm sure that the ghosts of Borley will not disappoint us. Human combustion. It takes something like 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit to consume a human body, bone and all. Yet nothing else but the victim burns. Not the clothing, some of the items they have. In one case, a grandmother sitting in her favorite chair, who was reading a book when her grandson had seen her, just around 11 o'clock at night. In the morning, the boy was sent up to get the grandmother when she didn't come down for breakfast. When he had gotten near her bedroom, there was a foul stench. Knocked on the door, there was no report from the woman. He tried the door. The doorknob was hot to the touch. At that point, he called his mother and father. They called the fire department. The door was broken open, and they found a grievous sight. Where the grandmother had been reading in her chair was now just a scorched chair. There was a black, sticky substance on the walls, the ceiling, and the floor. Only part of the foot bone and skull bone were left. On a dance floor in England, a young woman suddenly erupts into flames while dancing with her fiancé, a fire which could not be put out by anyone or anything. She is totally consumed. A young man at a crossroads in England pulls up in his pickup truck, waves to his friends. They wave back. Suddenly flames erupt from the cab. He is totally consumed, yet truck does not burn. For ten years to the day, another young man comes up to the same crossroads. Human combustion again takes place. Scientists call it human combustion. I call it double fire. If you were to ask me right now to prove to you that such a thing as the supernatural exists, I could do it very easily. I guess the best way to do it would be through modern day miracles. For instance, a few years ago in Eastone, Pennsylvania, the statue that you see here, which is made of plaster, is a Sacred Heart statue, bled human blood. This blood would drip down onto the altar cloth and form a perfect cross. Two apports, two materializations of communion wafers, would appear every afternoon at 3 o'clock, one on the left, one on the right. I investigated this case. I had the hands taken off, x-rayed. I had the blood analyzed by a laboratory and a medical doctor of 34 years. They said it was ancient human blood. Why ancient? Because there were very few white blood corpuscles in it. Miraculous miracle? No, it was a diabolical miracle. You see, Many hundreds and hundreds of people went before this statue looking for miracles for themselves, for loved ones, for friends. When these miracles were not forthcoming, who would they blame? God, of course. This is why the devil sometimes will perform what seem to be miraculous miracles. But just the same, even though we don't consider it supernatural, we do consider it preternatural. Supernatural, miraculous miracle, definitely. Bernadette Subaru. The beautiful lady that you see lying here 
in her coffin in Navarre, France. Died over 130 years ago. She is an incorruptible. This means that her body has never deteriorated. She, of course, was the young girl who had seen the visions of Our Lady at Lourdes. Miraculous miracle? Positively. Supernatural? Positively. No doubt about it. Virgin statues, 98 of them, that travel throughout the world. The Blue Army, as they are called, take these statues carved out of wood, and they take them to large cities, small hamlets, where the devout will say the rosary. But 98 of these that are carved out of wood also bleed human blood and shed human tears. Supernatural? Positively. Enrico Caruso, the very famous Italian tenor who died in 1921, made a very strange request upon his deathbed. He asked that his body not be embalmed, that it be taken from the family crypt in Italy every three years, that it be washed, redressed, and a tenor singing his favorite songs at the time. Of course, the family put this down to the ramblings of a dying man, but they went along with his wish. After all these years, Enrico Caruso's body, which had never been embalmed, has never deteriorated. He was a very religiously oriented man, an incorruptible, but also we have here a miraculous miracle. This doesn't look much like a haunted house to the average person, but in 1974, the very same year that Ronald DeFeo killed every member of his family in Amityville, Long Island, this house also came under diabolical attack. It seems that the young lady who lived in the home, 19 years old, with her mother, father, and two brothers, decided that she would use the Ouija board to try and find out what her future held. She did give an get answers, which were quite correct, but they were very costly, as you'll see. While her father had been showing slides of a place called Holy Land to some neighbors one afternoon, that same daughter came running in and said, Dad, water is running out of the wall from the next room. The man went in, and sure enough, water was coming out of the wall, but from no origin. No pipe, no nothing. At the same time, they heard something hitting the roof of the house went out. To see stones appearing about 20 feet above the roof of the house, coming down in a slow zigzag manner, defying gravity, sometimes coming down very swiftly and breaking windows, as you see here. Bottles would levitate off of their shelves. Tops would unscrew. The contents would spill out over furniture, onto the floors, etc. Radiator caps would unscrew themselves, fall to the floor. And of course, there would then be a leak. The screens looked as though somebody had taken a knife and had cut them out. This pipe, which of course holds electrical wiring, was bent down to the extent that it touched the roof and had to be replaced. It doesn't matter if the crockery is from the 5 and 10 or if it came from your great grandmother, an antique, it would smash and break. Holes would be punched into walls. Filthy obscenities written on those walls with crayons and other markings before the startled eyes of police officers who were hiding in the bushes looking for the culprits. They felt there was something physical happening when suddenly some of the bushes were torn off by the roots. The handle on the faucet being torn off and the bell being ripped out before their very eyes. The girl had just finished ironing her dress and put it on a hanger, hung it up on the back of her door, and went out to the kitchen where her parents were. They heard a loud rip. The dress was torn in half and laying on the floor as you see it here. A plastic pot had levitated across the room onto a burner, which had been put on by invisible hands. I had just told the family to take a piece of carnival glass off the refrigerator as it might get broken. Before they could do this, flew through the air and crashed to the floor, as you see it right here. The mother, father, daughter, the son, 
family dog would all sleep in the same bedroom, the master bedroom. Because all of them were very fearful of what might happen. They would sleep fully clothed. Everyone except the boy who slept in a sleeping bag alongside on the floor. The mother would have to sleep with her pocketbook under her arm. If she didn't, she would find the contents of it in the toilet bowl or else she just wouldn't find them at all. The first night we stayed there, Lorraine and I with a crew of three men from Channel 3 and Catholic priest. The poundings started that sounded like a gigantic fist, which was hitting up against the walls and the ceiling, the floors at the same time, to the extent that it actually cracked the plaster in the house. The family became very frightened. Lorraine and I had been in the boys' room, just lying down in the twin beds. The camera crew was in the hallway and the priest was in the kitchen. I went and sat on the bed with the family, mother, father, and the daughter. <clears throat> the small dog was also on the bed. The boy had been crying and became hysterical and went into the room with Lorraine. I commanded in the name of Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ what was there to reveal its identity. It wasted no time. With all of us on that bed, myself sitting on the bed with the parents and the daughter and the dog, it went up into the air, crashed to the floor. A bureau came careening towards us, hitting the bed, the drawers going in and out faster than you could count. The hairbrush came off, whisked past us, went down the hallway, hit one of the cameramen who fled the house that night, had to get another man. A set of rosary beads came off the post on the bed, floated down the hallway, made a left turn into the kitchen, and wrapped itself around the chair in which the priest was sitting. This was just one experience in one night. It was almost constant. Here you see the bureau with the drawers which opened up so quickly that you couldn't even count the times. The table at which the priest was sitting and one of the chairs that the rosary wrapped itself around. That table incidentally would go up into the air through a somersault and come down with a crash. The refrigerator, which weighed over 400 pounds in the background, would actually levitate out toward the middle of the room, one time breaking off the cord. In this shot, you see the levitation of a lamp, which had been on the small table just to the right there. It looked as though we were climbing the wall, hit the ceiling, and came down with a crash. It's a rumpus room, and it looks like a rumpus room. But this was something that was very common in that home. Toppling over a furniture, levitation of furniture, so forth. But here we have captured in this picture a huge bar stool and a light chair in the background, still levitating. The other chairs having already went over. A humorous sight to some people, but not to those that live in haunted houses. The levitation of a Coke bottle coming out of a room again the rumpus room, where I received two psychic slashes on my arm in the shape of a cross. I had been putting my arm up near my face to protect it against flying objects when this occurred. At that point I decided that the better part of valor was retreat. I started up the stairs. People think we don't get frightened in these situations. Well, we do, just like you would. Lorraine was at the top of the stairs with the door closed. She opened up the door when she heard me coming had a very surprised look on her face, and pointed to something in back of me. These three detergent bottles were following me up the stairs. When I turned around, the tops and screwed, and the contents spilt out onto the staircase as you see it here. Colin Evans was a gentleman who levitated hundreds of times before numerous people and many media. The fact that he could levitate was a fact, a reality. It was not any type of hoax. The family you see here is the Hodgson family of Enfield, England. The mother on the left, the daughter, Janet, who was 16 at the time, on the left of Lorraine, Margaret on the right, 17, Billy on the left, 9, and Johnny, 12. I think of all the cases we've ever been involved in, this case, 
in that suburb of London, Enfield. Probably the most interesting because of the many different facets of phenomena that have occurred. Not only did levitation, the movement of objects, strange sounds in the night and day, but there were the dematerializations that occurred. For instance, Janet there on the left had dematerialized before the eyes of scientists for 17 and a half minutes. She had also passed right through a solid brick wall into a Nottingham's apartment next door, meaning that the molecular structure of her body had broken down to the extent that she could pass right through solid matter. The girl would come under possession many times, as would her sister. She would be brought to the hospital, where she would be heavily sedated. But the voices, ladies and gentlemen, were the most incredible, as you will hear. The Enfield voices, as they are called, are to me diabolical voices. They claim to be the spirits of the dead. They are not. They are nothing that has ever walked this earth. But let's see some of the other phenomena which occurred in this home. In this shot, which was taken at a sixth of a second, you see two phenomena occurring at one time. The blankets being pulled off of Janet Hodgson and the curtain spiraling at the same time near the window on the left. You notice there are no legs on the bed. The bed would shake so violently that the legs were broken off. The wall that you see in the background there is the very wall to which Janet Hodgson passed through into the Nottingham's apartment next door, as I said in full view of investigators. This curtain came up on three occasions, sailed across the room, wrapped itself around Janet's neck, and started to strangle the girl. But look on the shelf in back of Mrs. Hodgson. You see a small radio, about 12 inches long, 6 inches wide. On about six different occasions, Mrs. Hodgson would have to call her brother, John Burkham, who lived just a few doors down from her. He would have to come over and lift Janet off of that radio after she levitated onto it while being sedated during the possessed state. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, we're now going to play parts of the voices which were recorded in this home. Now these are Cockney people, Cockney family. This means that they speak in a type of English dialect which is very hard to understand. I've been with these people sometimes for two or three days. I haven't understood anything they said at all. The ghostly voices that you will hear are, will also be speaking in Cockney. One will call itself Fred, the other Tommy. You will hear cars and trucks moving along on the street outside from time to time. In the house during these conversations with these two spirits, I have my two investigators, assistants helping me, John Kenny Hurst, Paul Bartz. The mother, two daughters, and two sons are talking with us. And over the conversation from time to time, you will hear the voices of the damned. I will ask if they know who I am. And they, one of them will say, Ed, Ed. I will ask if they are Christians of life. They will say, no, soldiers. I'll ask if soldiers aren't Christians, and you'll hear the response to that, which isn't a nice one. Fred, you know what this is? Dot, dot. A cross? Yeah. So you, uh, were you a Christian? No. What were you? How did you a soldier. Yeah. Well, aren't soldiers Christians? Yeah. They're, of course they're Christians, right? Now, sometimes you use Janet and sometimes you use Billy. Why yeah, but they've been coming at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You must be yeah. one of them. At the same time? Yeah. Tommy yeah, and Fred. Tommy and Fred. What was that? Tommy and Fred. Oh, Tommy. Tommy. Tommy and Fred. Yeah. No, get mate. Then we'll be sitting out there before they've been holding you to one another. You see the kids moving around. Oh, there's a snap. Oh, yeah. Fred, could you move something for us? No, but I won't. You don't want to? No. But I've come a long way. I've come 2,000 miles. Oh, I'm here from the other window. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Oh, 
Were you friends in life? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. And what was Tom? Was he a soldier too? Yeah. What kind of soldier? Um, how to? Hey, got cold and all that. Got cold and all What kind? Cold and all How's it got cold and all A soldier? Was it when you were British? 